good morning. Glad to have you worshiping with us uh, this morning here at New Life. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started uh, in our service. Uh, one would be there are some upcoming birthdays. I'm going to try not to miss it this week. Uh, so if you see uh, Abby Jackson or uh, Harry Shane or Kim McCoy, uh, they have birthdays that are coming up this week. So be sure to wish them a happy uh, birthday. Um, just a, a couple things. If you are a visitor, uh, we're glad to have you uh, with us. Uh, if you want to leave your contact info with um, uh, Mark at the back, you can uh, certainly do that. Um, the uh, offering is usually at the back, but I don't see the box there anymore, so uh, hopefully that'll be uh, fixed someday. Um, on Monday, of course, I'd like to remind you of uh, the men's and women's Bible study as well as uh, the kids, uh, Covenant Kids and Youth Group. So uh, if you're looking for something uh, more midweek, um, hopefully Monday will be midweek enough for you and you can come to the Bible study and, and have some uh, good fellowship and Bible study there as well. Um, there are a few things for us to have for uh, uh, prayer concerns. Uh, I know uh, Kathy Mader, we need to be uh, praying for her. She has uh, some test results that are coming up. We want to pray for her. Uh, and then uh, Courtney uh, with her mom is having some, um, has gotten results back. We want to be praying for her and uh, for Road Ahead in terms of uh, her diagnosis. And so uh, I'll be praying for uh, Courtney's um, mother and her her health and road ahead. Are there any other prayer requests that we need to know about? Yeah, Pat? Yes. Uh, I, we have some friends, deceases. We used to go to this church, and now they're just waiting for their area. And for the Cease's grandson. All right. Yeah. All right. Any other prayer requests? All right. If not, there are more announcements that are uh, within the uh, bulletin. You can take a look uh, in the inner flap to see some of those. And then uh, Bill wanted to come forward to uh, just address something uh, yesterday. So I can have you come forward this time. Last Sunday, near the end of my sermon, I heard the alarm from a device of an unknown person somewhere in the congregation, heard by some others also. I reacted with some frustration, and then when some in the congregation laughed, I reacted with some anger, admonishing uh, the unknown person and, in a sense, the congregation with inappropriate severity. That severe anger was wrong and sinful. It was an overreaction that was unfair to the unknown person and was an improper response that did not have a place during the sermon. After returning home, I asked God to forgive me, and then I ascertained from a congregant who the person might be, and that afternoon connected with the person by phone. I confessed my sin to that person, asked for forgiveness, and made things right. Upon further reflection, prayer, and a discussion with Pastor Nelson, I determined that because my sin had taken place publicly, it was important for me to make a public confession. So I am now declaring to any and all here today who were also present last Sunday, and to all who should have with me a desire for the well-being of this congregation, that I am sorry to have expressed that anger against that person and before the congregation. I deeply regret that I allowed my feelings to get the better of me and displayed such a lack of control during the vital act of preaching. I ask each of you to forgive me, to pray that I make progress in a better control of my feelings and to guide me in continuing service to this congregation. In that service, I do not want again to disturb the peace of God's people nor detract from the glory of God's name. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. I was... Um 
I'm actually really encouraged when you had contacted me and you wanted to talk to me about that. And um, I think it was, um, and you wanted to come up and, and say a few words. And um, I think it's good to hear. And I think it's a, a good example um, also to us, um, both to emphasize that we shouldn't be uh, fearful if an alarm or phone or kid goes off. Um, we want you here. Uh, but also to show that we believe in, as Christians, uh, um, in repentance and a God of grace. And um, I thank you for doing that. That might preach more than many of my sermons have preached. So thank you again uh, for coming to me and wanting to do that. Um, we're going to take a few minutes uh, right now in which we are going to uh, prepare uh, to enter into worship and uh, prepare perhaps by reading the word or spending some time in prayer uh, to come to a gracious and good God uh, in gratitude and in reverence and in awe. Please stand for the call to worship. The call to worship this morning is taken from uh, Matthew 11. It's one of my favorite calls to worship. It's the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ here where he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
So let's begin doing that by turning in our hymnals to number 248 and sing All Creatures of Our God and King, number 248 in the Trinity Psalter, that's the newer hymnal.
Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you are great and you are greatly to be praised. And so, Lord, when we think of your steadfast love, when we think of the ways in which you have carried us along in good times and in bad, in our virtues and despite our vices, uh, Lord, we come to praise you this morning. We come not to cite our own name. We come not to cite the name of any group or denomination. Lord, we come to you not in the mediation of any mere man, but in the name of the one who is both God and man, the one who is perfect. We come uh, seeking to praise you through the mediation of Christ, the one who told us that it would neither be on uh, one hill or another, but that we would seek to praise you in spirit and in truth. And so this morning we come uh, partly because we are commanded, but also partly because we are needy. Lord, we need again uh, the grace that is given through uh, the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we come needy again to be reminded of the things that we have forgotten, the, the virtues and duties that we have been uh, forgetting to do in our lives, but also the grace that enables and the grace that forgives. And so, Lord, we come this morning because we need you. Lord, we come this morning because you are worthy of praise. And so, hear our prayers for the sake of Christ. Lord, hear our praises as they are brought to you by the Spirit. And Lord, speak to us through your word. May we know who you are. May we know your gracious invitation. Lord, may we know the duties you require of us. And Lord, may we also know the forgiveness that you give to us in Jesus Christ. Lord, may we know all of that in the midst of the worship service as we come to invoke not our own name, but the name of Jesus Christ, our mediator, our head. And so, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our confession of faith today comes from Romans chapter 8. Please confess with me. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you please join me now in our hymn of faith? It's found in your old hymnal, number 67, The Love of God. You may remain seated.
let's bring our burdens before the Lord. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you knowing that Christ intercedes for us in order for us to be in your presence, and the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Lord, we come as needy people, needy of your daily bread and your daily graces. We could not be sustained a day or even a second apart from your enabling graces. And so we pray that you would listen to us for Christ's sake as we bring our needs before your throne. Lord, we give you praise that you have heard previous prayers that you have been working in our lives uh, through our needs, be they physical or spiritual. And so we bring new ones to you. Lord, we remember Kathy Mater as she is going to be going over test results in the next day or so. And uh, pray that you would give her strength as well as wisdom to doctors and nurses uh, for steps ahead with her. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray the same for Courtney's mother, who is also getting test results and, and looking at options for treatments. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would be near to her and give her encouragement as well. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, the CISA's grandson, who is in the hospital, and for blood clots, um, that uh, there would be a road ahead and uh, treatment there. Uh, Lord, we bring these uh, to you as they weigh in our hearts, but we pray for the souls as well as the bodies of those that are afflicted, that they might have their hope and steadfast uh, trust in you and in your unshakable kingdom. Lord, we continue to pray for Effie Reimer and Gladys Hughes, uh, for Pat and Amy Marshall, for Joanne Baird, for Ruth Ann Woods and Tom Duncan, uh, for Shirley Seaman, and for Patty Davis' sister Peggy. Uh, we continue to pray for the Maiders and for uh, Dory McElvain and for her strength to return, as well as uh, Cass, Rob's grandmother. Lord, we pray for all of their uh, well-beings and comfort, uh, but Lord, we pray that they would know you as the great comforter and trust you in your ways. Lord, we uh, also pray for uh, our nation. We pray for our leaders. Uh, we especially pray for our leaders in this time in which um, we may have woken up with, with news of of conflict in the Middle East, and Lord, there's so many things that take wisdom beyond uh, the natural capabilities of our, of our leaders, and so we pray that you would give them wisdom. Uh, Lord, may they act in ways that are wise and, um, and safe and just. Uh, Lord, we pray, uh, too, for others that are doing uh, works of necessity even now. Uh, of course, we think, as usual, of uh, police and medical and emergency uh, personnel, but Lord, we also think of military and that they may not be in ha harm's way. Um, Lord, we, we bring our concerns to you of often physical things, but Lord, we also pray for those and their spiritual needs, which are sometimes harder to, to name and to admit to. So Lord, we pray for those that are wrestling with sin and temptation. Lord, we pray for those that are wrestling with depression and uh, a darkness of the soul. Lord, we pray for those that are facing hard decisions or, Lord, that have uh, broken relationships or those that needed mended. And, Lord, we pray that you would be active there as well, answering prayers that uh, may not be spoken, but, Lord, you know and you are capable of answering. Lord, soften hearts and, Lord, give us strength. And, Lord, we, we bring our concerns to you, Lord, because you know what is best. You are all-knowing. You are all-powerful. And you are good and you are true to your word. And so, Lord, since you know better than us what is for our good and your glory, we leave our burdens with you. Grant us faith and patience to wait upon you. For you are our good Father, that we might even be able to address you with the words that we've been taught to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 5. Verses 6 through 21, it's found on page 177 of your pew Bible. If you would like to turn and follow along, I'll give you a moment to find that. It should be a very uh, familiar passage.
Hear now the word of the Lord. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any other, any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his donkey, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. We will now confess our sin together, found in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. Please confess with me. Now we know that whatever the law says... It speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We just read in Deuteronomy uh, an account of God freeing the, Egypt, or freeing the Israelites from Egypt in a house of slavery, and then shortly after that, he lists his Ten Commandments, which in some sense shows our slavery to sin. So as we prepare to confess our sins, keep in mind that through the law, sin became known to us. But as we look in verse 6 of Deuteronomy, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. So as you look at these Ten Commandments, think about, this is my Egypt. This is my house of slavery. And we have somebody who delivered us, who saved us, who freed us from that house of slavery. So why would we ever want to go back? But we do. But fortunately, we have someone who forgives us of our sin, is constantly working on our behalf, and work to free us from this sin work to free us from this slavery. So let's silently pray, confess our sins before our Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who can free us from this slavery of sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your law. It has allowed us to see our sin, and it has allowed us to come to the one who can free us from our sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we ask for forgiveness, and we ask for cleansing. Amen. Now hear the assurance of pardon from Romans chapter 3, 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, 
the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of God, the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Would you please stand for our song of grace? It's found on page 16b of the Trinity Psalter hymnal, Preserve Me, O God. ourselves back again in the book of Hebrews as we are going to be entering into the final chapter of the book of Hebrews. Um, if we've forgotten a little bit of where we've been, uh, the theme of Hebrews is a pretty simple one to state. Jesus is better. Better than what? Anything that's come before. Uh, better than the Old Testament sacrifices, a better leader than uh, the failed uh, leaders and the sinful leaders before, even if they were on the good end of the spectrum like Moses or, or on the bad end. Um, he is better than all of those things. And then uh, we're presented towards the end of the book of Hebrews with this admonition to live by faith. That was something that was good that was modeled uh, in the Old Testament. And yet all of the, the faith that um, the faith was always looking forward towards Christ. He was the author and perfecter of our faith. And so uh, it's in that context that we hear of discipline. We hear of training. Uh, we hear of being built up uh, and trained in the Lord. And 
Um, as it is happening towards the end of chapter 12, you, you probably heard something here, and I'm gonna, we're going to read that and then get into the uh, beginning of chapter 13 because there's a connection there uh, between the end that talks about acceptable worship and then what flows out of that, uh, what overflows that. Uh, there's a direct connection with our reaction to Christ and the discipline and the training that we've had and the life that we live and the admonitions and the instructions that are given in 13. So we're going to see what that is uh, as we read here in a minute. We'll start for context in verse 27 and then read until 13.3. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we confess this is your word. Lord, you uh, carried along men as they wrote it with the ultimate author being the Holy Spirit. But Lord, we pray that we would listen to your word, that we would uh, heed your word, and that is to agree with it, uh, that is to love it, and that is to apply it to our lives. Uh, but Lord, we pray that you give us the strength for that. Give us a picture of the grace and power that you give through Jesus Christ as we hear his word this morning. And this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to start in verse 27 in chapter 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let Brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. The grass withers and the flower fades, but this the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. I said the end of chapter 12 really is a foundation uh, to the final chapter, to chapter 13. But how? Well, let me ask you this. If the police were to show up in full SWAT gear, how would you feel? Probably the answer to that depends on whether you think that they're there to uh, get you or to protect you and rescue you. Uh, the same sight could be something fearful for some, and a great comfort to others. And so when we read at the end of chapter 12 that our God has this unshakable kingdom and he is a consuming fire, to some that is a fearful sight. But to those who are in Christ, it's an assurance. To those who have faith and who have an interest in him and being also a comfort. In fact, the emotion at the end of, of Hebrews in 27 and 28 is, yes, reverence and awe, but also those are both prefaced by gratitude, that we are to be thankful for receiving an unshakable kingdom, uh, thankful and grateful and content and have a, an element of relief to that, uh, gratitude that is secure enough not to be in terror, but in reverence and awe at the God who has come to rescue us, the, the God who is coming in full SWAT gear, but is on our side. And to this, we have awe at his power, but we also have comfort in seeing that. And so Hebrews 13, 1 to 3 has a natural flow here. Um, I don't believe that chapter 13 is just pasted on at the end. Some have thought, well, it almost seems like this becomes an epistle at the end, and maybe that was added in. No, there is a natural flow from the end of 12 uh, into 13 in terms of what is, uh, what is called at the end of 12, acceptable worship. Acceptable worship is done by those who are residents of, of an unshakable kingdom. And to think that this would be a comfort to those who, many of which are, are living in exile, uh, as there has been this, uh, this uh, exile of people from Rome. Uh, many people receiving this letter perhaps have not been able to move back home to where they were from. And so this would be a comfort in the midst of that, in the midst of hearing rumors of rebellion that's going to happen in Jerusalem uh, by uh, 67 AD. There's going to be these new rebellions that pop up, and there's going to be persecution. And in the midst of all of that, of a, of a kingdom that is, seems to be coming after them, they hear of this 
unshakable kingdom. So when they go from old covenant worship to new covenant, they know that they are in an unshakable kingdom. Even though they know they likely will never see the temple again, they are not to be shaken by that. When discipline and persecution and suffering comes into their life, they should learn Christ and holiness rightly and not be afraid. Because even knowing that, though, in a quake, a lot of things uh, can come to ruin. A lot of things are shaken free, even the uh, news of a quake in the past uh, week or two uh, on, the west, on the East Coast uh, left a lot of people wondering uh, what is secure, what is unshaken. So what is unshaken? Uh, we'll look at the natural connection here one more time. In, in between chapter 12 and 13, which is not part of the original text, uh, the, the margin that's in your Bibles, the, the separation so they could put the big 13 in there was put later. It just naturally flowed. And, and listen to how it naturally flows here. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And then you may be asking how, how is this acceptable worship shown even outside of that? Let brotherly love continue. Certainly, what's being talked about at the end of 12 is what happens in a worship service. Um, certainly, it's what happens on a Sunday morning in that hour, but that's only our first application. It can't stay there. When we walk outside of the walls of the church, Christian love is an aspect, it's an overflowing of worship, because worship is an overflow of the enjoyment and gratitude of God. Living by faith, worship in the rest of our lives is showing brotherly love then, and is founded on this unshakable reality, a joy that overflows into love. And the word that's used here is brotherly love, that it should continue. And in fact, if you were uh, looking at this in, in the original text, you'd actually know this word, even though you may not know that you know it. Uh, it's made up of two parts. Uh, one is philia, which is a love, and the next is adelphos, which is brothers, which is together Philadelphia, which of course, is a city you immediately think of when you think of brotherly love, right? <laughs> well, it's what the, uh, the aspirations of the founders of that city uh, were having there. They, they wanted brotherly love to be the theme, right? And within the church, brotherly love makes sense. If we all have God as our father in the church, that means that we are siblings. That means that the love that we express uh, for each other is based on our shared relationship with God the Father. And so the love that we show should be reflection should be derivative, uh, should be uh, acted out in response to the love that God has shown us. It's an overflow of our worship and gratitude for the unshakable kingdom, for seeing God, for seeing him show up in that way. Love for others then directly corresponds to uh, the love God gives to us, which also means if, if our love is deficient, perhaps we have a deficient understanding or experience of the love of God. That's because the love of God is, is much more robust and means much more than any Hallmark movie has ever made it out to be. Uh, the cultural idea of love as this feeling that comes and goes, uh, immediately comes in and then can immediately go, is felt and given to those who deserve to be loved. Perhaps uh, that's been said to one another, you know, you deserve to be loved. And this is a cultural idea that love is something that is deserved, that is something that is felt. That's not what is in mind here when we look at God's love. That's not a love that has a family resemblance to the Father. To be brotherly love, there is a connection to how the Father has loved us and the relationship there. Love, to be a reflection of God's love, must mean then loving the unlovable or loving someone with aspects of them that are unlovable or not lovely or downright ugly sometimes. You know why? Because that's how the Heavenly Father has loved us. That is how the Heavenly Father loved us. And fatherly love translates into this brotherly love in view here because of how he loved us. Not based on, on feels, uh, but based on the way he's loved us. There's a, there's a great book some people have read uh, that has a lot of uh, useful uh, application to it. It's called uh, The Four Loves. Uh, by C.S. Lewis. And it's, it's fascinating, although it's a bit too neat and tidy, because he uses these four Greek words to talk about four different types uh, of love. He talks about affection, uh, friendship, uh, romantic love, and then divine love, and uses storge and philia and eros and agape to talk about them. I, I say it's a bit too neat and tidy, because 
Greek actually uses some of those words interchangeably. Uh, Philia and agape can actually be used uh, as synonymous terms. But he's right to put his finger on something. And that is different relationships have different sorts of love. Right? Affection within, within the family is different than, than friendship sorts of love, which is different than romantic love. In fact, some of our cultural uh, misideas about love and just saying love is love doesn't see that there's different sorts of love. There's different ways to love. There's different ways in which it expresses itself. And yet, for the Christian, agape, divine love, the love that God has shown us, should infect all of those relationships so that it's not just about how we feel in a given moment. It should be a lesson to us as we're looking through all of chapter 13, and eventually in verse 14, or verse 4, we're going to get to uh, the love that's within marriage, uh, that it is not a falling in love that's talked about here, but it's something that's deeper than that. Because if you only base your, your love to your mate on falling in love, then you can fall out of love. If you're only basing your friendship with somebody because you immediately hit it off, what happens when you stop hitting it off? Uh, if you only base your reaction, uh, in fact, to loving somebody in the church or loving the church uh, based on the fact that you walked in and immediately something clicked for you, what happens when you see the ugly parts? Not that it's bad to have uh, an immediate reaction to somebody that becomes a, a mate or somebody that becomes a, a friend or even to see a good quality in a church community, but um, know that a feeling, while it's great when it accompanies love, is not the great virtue here of divine love. Sometimes I worry uh, if somebody comes in and they say they immediately fell in love uh, with new life. That's great to hear. Uh, just don't immediately fall out of love uh, when somebody is randomly rude to you and you don't know why. Uh, or you hear a lesson that falls flat. Or you have to sing that hymn and it just didn't do it for you. Uh, don't immediately fall out of love when, when something like that happens, when there's some sort of a, a disappointment. You know why? Because in, in all of our relationships, whether it's friends, family, whether it's spouses, whether it's people within the church, we are called to love humans. And humans make errors. And humans have feelings and can be hurt and then hurt people, hurt other people. You know, to risk, to, to love is to risk and then to, to eventually to guarantee being hurt. What do you do with that? What are we commanded to do with that? In light of the love of the Father, what are we commanded to do with that? Because some people just refuse. They're not going to love, but that's not how God has loved us. Some people will love until it's hard or until there's work involved, and then they just find a new mate, a new friend, a new church, Uh, but that's not how Christ loved us. Uh, But others will stick it out. And for them, true love then has a meaning and it has a joy for the joy that was set before him. What did Christ do? Not he loved us when we were lovely, not he loved us when it was easy, but he endured the cross. When we're told brotherly love should continue, we should go all the way back to the beginning of chapter 12 and realize we've been shown what love looks like, not in that we loved God, not in that others loved us, but that God loved us. Brotherly love assumes that there's a brother on the other end, not an ideal, not a dream. We must love the reality not just our dream or ideal of that person, of that mate, or of that church. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is not somebody I recommend that you read everything that he wrote. In fact, if you have his ethics, throw it away. It's terrible. He even didn't think it was good. Um, But he wrote this little book that was great. It's called Life Together, and it was to encourage the church in the midst of a society that seemed to be going crazy in in Nazi Germany in the 30s, uh, for them to stick together and to love each other. And he wrote this in there as, as a little instruction. He says, He who loves his dream of a community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter. In other words, you don't love ideas or the ideal person or the ideal community. In fact, you love an actual person, an actual community, which is much messier, right? When you pledge within a a wedding service, you don't say, as long as we both shall feel Uh, We don't say, uh, when we have a meaningful relationship, I'm going to be friends with you uh, until, you know, until it's work (laughs) or it's hard. Because we're called to love sinners. No spouse, no friend, no person within the church that you're to love is immune from sin. Because uh, here might be the shock of the sermon. Because you too are human and you too are a sinner. And the reason that you are loved is God is gracious. The reason you're deserving of dignity is God made you in his image. And God is deserving of dignity and love. It's not a call to just hate yourself in depression and always think that you're the worst. 
Yet when you see love or dignity that is given to you from others within the church, you say, this is because God loves undeserving sinners like me. We are the sinners, not just our spouse, not just our friends, not just our church. We are all sinners. You are the one who needs change and forgiveness too. That's why Christian love, brotherly love, is worship. It has to take an overflow of gratitude. The the fuel from it cannot be natural. It has to be supernatural. Brotherly love then comes from an overflow of joyful worship. That is an appreciation of God's love to you that works itself out in love. Not because we love God, but because he loved us us, which then translates further here. If you, if you look at your text one more time, he continues. He doesn't just say brotherly love. Uh, what else uh, does he include in that? He says next, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Except that's not actually what it says. Uh, the word hospitality there is not just to show hospitality, uh, to welcome somebody in. Uh, in fact, it's another philia word. Uh, There's Philadelphia, that's love of siblings, but this one is, um, forgive my pronunciation, philon ex ia. Uh, It's a combination of philia again, and then uh, xeno. Perhaps you've heard that before, maybe in politics, somebody will accuse somebody else of xenophobia. You're afraid of foreigners or strangers. And so if you had philia and xeno and you put those together, what do you have? You have the love of strangers. Uh, What does he say here? He says, let brotherly love continue and show love to strangers. Verse one, brothers. Verse two, love of strangers. Now, what's interesting here is that you may have entertained angels unaware. You may have actually entertained uh, those that are part of the body unaware. And so in this whole section, there seems to be a, a love primarily focused on the church. And yet hospitality is in that way of perhaps somebody that's connected to the church, but you don't know them. Uh, if you're going to travel, if you were to travel to a new city, what are you going to do? Well, when you get there, um, you're probably going to find a hotel to stay in. Well, in the ancient world, there weren't a whole lot of hotels. And what you would do, especially if you're in the church, is go find the church. And there were people from the church that would house you there. In fact, when missionaries come to visit, sometimes we'll ask if anybody wants to put them up, uh, which uh, sometimes happens. Sometimes a pastor will put them in their house, sometimes others. Uh, And yet, uh, it's interesting over over the years, perhaps as we pay more attention to the news, uh, we get more scared and conscious about uh, does our house look like it's supposed to on HD network? Or, uh, do we, um, uh, are we afraid that, in fact, they're going to assault us if we're watching too much cable news? And, and then we, we don't seem to practice that as much. And, and you know what? Some of us might be nervous about it. Some of us might be vulnerable. But there's other ways to show hospitality, not just like in the early church of having a spare room. Uh, but think about it. When somebody walks into the house, into the, into the walls of the church, in some ways this is our family house. And so are we inviting them in? Are we welcoming them in? Uh, Do we perhaps even invite somebody over uh, for a meal? Or or when we have conversation, are we hospitable in our conversation? Uh, Why? Why do we we need to do this? Uh, Well, I think we need to do this with with some sort of a motivation uh, that is not merely you're supposed to do this, right? Uh, Have you ever had somebody be hospitable to you, but you know it's forced that, that's not enjoyable. Um, so maybe as an actor would say, what's my motivation? Uh, if you're thinking about a motivation for this, where would your mind go? As I'm reading this, actually, uh, my mind first went to, okay, if I'm writing Hebrews, okay, bear with me. If I'm writing Hebrews and I say, you should show love to strangers, my mind immediately goes to Matthew 24. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me in, right? I'd go straight to Christ because it's the body of Christ and you should be loving Christ. Interestingly enough, that's not where the writer of Hebrews goes. And he doesn't go there perhaps because he's just been talking about Old Testament saints. And so he goes back to uh, and makes an allusion to something in the Old Testament. Uh, When he said, you may be entertaining angels unaware, uh, this is a reference back to Abraham in in Genesis when they welcomed the messengers from the Lord, the three, uh, into the house. And he, he, uh, he made sure they were welcomed in and they made food for them. And he entertained angels unaware. Well, the word there is is angelos. If you're in our Sunday school, we've looked at that word quite a bit. It can either mean an angelic being, uh, which it looks like the case in in Genesis that was the case, but it can also mean messengers. And whether it's angels or or messengers, hospitality is played out in the church because you never know who you're entertaining. Somebody associated uh, with the church or somebody that maybe is a messenger uh, to others uh, when they come in. 
I, I remember in um, uh, this uh, being shown to us uh, when we were down in Texas. We came into a church, and immediately that Sunday, we were invited over for lunch. Um, and, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the way that it's shown in the church. It could just be in, in welcoming in, not saying, hey, you can't sit in that pew because it's for the Wilsons or whatever. Um, there's other ways to welcome in. And, and you never know who's watching. Uh, I, was, I was sent a, a video, actually, by a friend of mine, uh, another PCA pastor friend, of this guy, and he makes YouTube videos, and perhaps you've encountered this before, somebody that does uh, police audits, right, to see if people know their rights. And so he'll go and he'll audit police or business people and see if they, they know his rights. And this is a guy that likes to stand outside either government buildings or uh, businesses, and he had a sign that read, God bless the homeless vets. Sometimes people would think he's panhandling and uh, call the police to come take him away, and then he'd say, hey, look, First Amendment, both religious and freedom of speech, I'm just, uh, I'm on the sidewalk, I'm not on public property, or on a private property, and then uh, would make uh, that his, uh, his video that would get views, and he'd get money from that, or if he got arrested, he could sue, so some of the uh, motivations are not entirely pure, I don't know. Uh, but the video he shared with me was when he went outside of a sister PCA church. And when he went outside of that church, what happened when people were coming in, people stopped and they said, how can I help you? Do you need any help? And it was great. It was the most boring video of, of all of his videos on there. It had the least number of views because nobody got upset with him. In fact, at the end of the video, an elder comes out and says, we're having a meal inside. Do you want to come in? And he said, no, here's what I'm doing and this is, this is why I'm doing it. And at the end of it, he just kind of was like, well, I guess that went well. And then he walks off. Oh. What a great thing. Like he, nobody knew he was videoing it. This was just what people saw, the hospitality of God's family house, of inviting him in, uh, then became the most boring video on his feed. Um, but it, it was exciting just of other people seeing the hospitality, the love of the stranger of the church. Now, that's not to say that we as a church should uh, not have anything where we have principles where we say, you can't have this here, uh, you can't have uh, something that is uh, not in line with our doctrine or something like that. Um, this is not to say that you show love in the world's understanding as you give money to a drug addict. No, that's not love. But what it does say is the hospitality there could be a messenger to somebody else to see how do we treat those? How does the love of God overflow to love a brother, to love a stranger? And then the strange thing, we have, we have just one more little verse here, and that is love of those in prison. How does that even fit? Well, actually, if you're in the early church, it made a lot of sense because probably you knew somebody in the church that was in prison, <laughs> somebody that had been arrested, right? Be it Paul or be it your pew mate that got arrested uh, because they didn't participate in the worship of the emperor and got arrested for trying to do business without doing that. It made a lot of sense. Now today, we read that and we say, I, I don't know anybody that's been arrested for being a Christian <laughs> that's in prison for that reason. Uh, and yet, how do we understand this today? How might this work today? Um, when I was uh, away in, um, in the pastor's retreat, I actually met up again with a guy who used to be here in Western PA. Some of you know Mitch. Um, he actually moved down to Alabama. And when he moved down to Alabama, he started working in a prison that was there. And they started doing this work uh, to go in and, and just preach the gospel in the chapel area and to try to make disciples and started discipling some people that were uh, in the, the prison there. And it's been work that's been going on for a while and heard about it again from another of my friends down there, Derek. And uh, today, in the prison, there is a bigger functioning church than the churches that they're actually pastoring outside of the prison. And what's amazing from that is that uh, the, the prisoners have, have started evangelizing each other. And, and when they worship together, um, check this out, there, there is a member of the Aryan nation worshiping next to a former member of the Black Panthers, to which these two are now uh, calling each other brother and worshiping together and have repented in tears to each other of their hate, former hatred of each other. How does that happen? How do these two that hated each other now see each other as brothers within the prison? Well, they do that because of divine grace, of something supernatural. They worship together now. And the acceptable worship pours over, spills over into their lives uh, together. And, they, and we should remember those in prison because, spiritually speaking, we're worshiping next to them this morning. We have brothers and sisters in Christ in prison still. 
And so as we look at that, as you look at, at what is laid out here, as, as worship spills into brotherly love, into, into love of the stranger, even into the love of those uh, in prison, uh, what do we get from this? Let, let me just end with, this, with these brief exhortations to us here. When we see Hebrews 13, 1, and, and then following, uh, what we have here is a stunning picture, not just of Christians doing good things, but of the love of God and the power of God and the patience of God and the grace of God. Because God came not to love us because we're just such lovable children. He came to love us when we were still enemies. He came to love us when we were a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He came to us in the prison of our sin and the slavery of our sin. And God's love changed us and freed us and empowered us to love, didn't it? Or if it didn't, uh, we, we have to look at the evidences and say, why do we keep looking like we don't have that experience? Have we not understood or experienced God's love enough to, to know that we ought to care about others' feelings and not just our own? And to know that we need to care about our own sins and fighting them and not just the sins of others. Uh, to know that we ought not to get angry with a screen and not realize there's a person on the other side of that screen. That when we see somebody new coming in, they're not somebody that might change the feel of our church, but they're a stranger that we should welcome. And when we see someone in prison, they're not irredeemable. God can even redeem those who are behind bars and those in prison. Brothers and sisters, there may be those that you need to reconcile with because you haven't realized how the love of the Father should influence brotherly love to, to those in the church, to those who are strangers, to those that are on a mission field of prison or, or further away. Brothers and sisters, Jesus sought you when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. And so does your love for the stranger have a hospitality to it? Brothers and sisters, the spirit didn't stay in Jerusalem, but went to the four corners of the earth, and in fact, even went to those in prison. Does our heart have a heart for missions as well? We have received an unshakable kingdom, and that should ease our anxieties about sharing an unshakable love, one that reflects our Father and how he's loved us in brotherly love, one that reflects our Savior and how he loved and ran after us when we were strangers and one that reflects the spirit who is within us and has freed us and gone after us when we were wayward. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have broken into our lives in ways that are first frightening and then are comforting. Lord, we are in reverence and awe and grateful for the ways in which you change us and love us despite ourselves and not because of ourselves. And Lord, we pray that you continue to, to shape and mold us into those that reflect our Father. Lord, remind us of our adoption. Remind us of the new family that we have. Lord, give us some resemblance of the family through the Holy Spirit in the way that we worship, but also in the way that we love. And so, Lord, we pray that because of the love that has been shown for us in Christ Jesus, so it's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Let's open up our hymnals uh, once more and sing about this reality. Number 534 is in your hymnals. Fill thou my life, O Lord, my God. Would you stand as we sing this together?
Now may we go with the good word of God's benediction from Romans 15, 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.